31st of October, 1906. I met the earnest agitator when I was 16. On the way back home from school, I wandered into a protest. There must have been a hundred people outside this absurd mansion's gate, blocking the whole road. I got curious and asked someone what all this was about. This prick is paying off parliament to knock down housing for the poor, the earnest agitator replied. We got to talking, and I couldn't stop listening. She had such a fiery drive in her eyes and words. At the time, I never really thought about the poor, but she told me about herself and all her friends and how hard things were for them. I wish I could say I came to my senses right then, but my upbringing was far too ingrained in me for that. We started meeting when I could disappear for a while without making anybody suspicious. I knew my parents wouldn't want me hanging out with her. Somehow she had the patience to put up with my bullshit, and I'm forever grateful to her for opening my eyes. Over the next two years, I grew increasingly angry with my family, all that they've done and all that they stand for. I hid my simmering anger. I was scared I would ruin my life. The earnest agitator knew I had to get away from my parents and become my own person. She talked me into running away with her, and just after I turned 18, we ran away together and signed up on the same ship together. We got as far away from London as we could. She set me on my path to the skies. Comrade Elizabeth. Welcome back to Sunless Skies. In the last episode, we went to the floating parliament and checked it out, and now we have an invitation to become an MP at Perdurance, which is where we've gone to now. And in the last episode, when we just arrived at Perdurance, haven't explored it in the slightest. Let's check out Perdurance. I think I have like five invitations to it, so I should be fine. Arriving at Perdurance. On approach, Perdurance looks like an opulent mansion caught partway through a genteel explosion. Each constituent set of rooms accounted for, but separate and out of place. Each is connected in a rough circle by narrow, winding passages. The steep roofs are topped with shingled turrets and precarious towers. The elegantly disassembled country house perches on top of a soot-stained, windowless factory whose chimneys belch gouts of smoke and fire. Yeah, I thought all the pipes and every and all the industrial stuff around here was weird, given that this also sounds sort of like an exclusive club for rich people. Enter the parlor. The docks face a set of polished oak doors carved with a series of masked figures dancing the quadrille. The windows in the parlor are shuttered, the lights stained with pale yellows, blushing pinks and bruised violets. Lit with the illusion of dawn, or perhaps dusk, you see a room cluttered with stiff-backed armchairs and decorative chases set against savagely floral wallpaper in shades of burgundy violet and Brunswick green. A portrait of the Empress, unsmiling, hangs in an ornate gilt frame. A few visitors mill about, casting speculative glances at the exasperated butler while they pretend to examine the decor. Let's write a port report. Perdurance is a jewel in the Empire's crown, where its favorite sons and daughters are pampered, protected, and preserved. Important matters. The visitors are puffed up with importance and embarrassingly eager to tell you how they obtained an invitation to the Half-Light Mask. Some through patronage or long service, others through less salubrious means. All are desperate to spend a day in the company of the glittering inhabitants of Perdurance. The brightest stars and Albion's, Albion's firmament. For here the sons and daughters of Her Majesty's most important courtiers reside in eternal youth and sophistication. Man, do I want to fuck with these people here. Ah, right. Invitation. Um, mm, let's check out some other things first. Locomotive captains gather at Bazaar to trade good. Uh, yeah, it's just a generic description. Ooh, immaculate souls and their bargains. Christ, if immaculate souls are 215 at a bargain, then these must be worth a shit ton. At, like, full price, and especially, <clears throat> especially as a prospect. I think this is the most expensive item I've ever come across. Before this, it was the bronzewood. 
Can I make a shit ton of money just by buying all of them? Also, remember I'm supposed to present some immaculate souls to one of the repentant devil's old old friends in London as a gift? Otherwise they might chew me up or something? Something like that. A somber footman offers discerning visitors a chance to admire and procure samples from Perdurance's collection of souls. A reason an exceptional donation, he says, showing you said that burn fiercely in their fluted bottles. To accompany the arrival of a duke's daughter, a gift of souls is considered good luck. Hmm. Uh, well, I can always come back here if I want to. I'll probably end up buying those. Ah, this place exports ministry approved literature. Yes! The first place I found that does that. I knew it would be somewhere in London. Yeah, before I've only gotten these in bargains. Okay, back to the antechamber. Yeah. Oh god, our aunt is here. <laughs> let's save that for later. Uh, let's talk to the exasperated butler. He appraises you with an officious disapproval that testifies to years of devoted training. Uh, yes, and, he demands... He leaves through a leather-covered logbook to make clear that he is, in fact, terribly busy. Inquire about the nature of Perdurance. What is this place? He sighs. This is Perdurance, the home of the Half-Light Mask. Here, Her Majesty has created a single perfect day wherein the finest examples of the Empire's youth may reside for all time. At the day's end, there is a grand ball. When it's over, the day is spun anew with fresh hours and all begins again. No one who resides here will age even a single day. Visitors are permitted, of course, relatives and a select few others, as long as they have an invitation, he says pointedly. To keep reliving the same day. Fresh hours. Wow. Huh. Well, I can ask about gaining an invitation, but, I mean, we already have a lot of invitations. I am curious, though, what they say. If one must ask how to obtain an invitation, one probably shouldn't have it. Typically, they're granted to the relatives of residents. However, the Ministry of Public Decency may award invitations to those who have served the Empire. We also receive an unusual number of visitors from the Royal Society. An invitation permits the bearer entry to a single instance of the mask from morning to evening. You thank him, but he clearly wishes to impress upon you the grandeur of the matter. It is a great honor to be invited here, and an even greater one to be rewarded with a residence. The Empress is most generous with her favored servants. He gives you a sharp look and adds, And we are all her servants, are we not? Shit, they know I'm a traitor. <laughs> so an invitation only buys you a single day. Okay. So you don't just need one invitation then, that's why. Th there's actually a reason to have more than one. I wonder what staying here for a day is going to do. Is that going to probably reduce our terror or something? Let's ask about the debutantes. Who is permitted to reside here? Why, they are the sons and daughters of Her Majesty's most valued, most trusted counselors and confidants. The residents want for nothing. They need fear nothing. They will not grow old or know care or worry. They will be preserved forever in the flower of their youth and innocence. These are the gifts that are her renewed majesties to grant. Can the debutantes leave? He's been suspiciously silent on that score. Why on earth would they want to do that? To do so would seem remarkably ungrateful. Who chooses the debutantes, and according to what criteria? Her renewed majesty, of course. She chooses them herself from among the children of her most beloved advisors and agents. This is the reward for service, immortality and luxury for one's issue. Could there be anything better? Ah, nepotism. Wait, let me look that word up. That does mean what I think it means, right? Yeah, that was the right use of nepotism. I could stand for parliament without even... Having an invitation. Mm. 
It costs 50 sovereigns to stand. It is refunded if you win. You may now stand. I need veils to do it. 70% chance of success is pretty good. I don't know what the hell it would gain me, though, because I don't think it means anything. Uh, let's hand my invitation. Through the Empress, straight on till morning. The portrait of the Empress swings open and a succession of brightly dressed debutantes, sour-faced chaperones, and prim servants stumbles into the parlor. They barely have a moment to rest their feet and take a sip of tea before a panel of wallpaper slides open, the dark maw of a sharply curving passage just visible in the dawn light. The exasperated butler snatches the invitation from your hands. Remember, your invitation only lasts one day. It is a warning, but sounds a little wistful. It propels you forward to join the court in its procession. You emerge a little tender into the morning. Let's see what we can do here. Find a way below the stairs with the Incognito Princess? Yes, we can do Incognito Princess stuff! Oh, I've been waiting to do more stuff with her for a while. Especially Elizabeth. Oh, and yes, the Rat Brigade does need stuff here as well. Oh, fucking sweet. The morning room is a grander version of the parlor, presided over by the... Arate Duchess in her pink and purple silks. Dowagers of varying stateliness and aplomb take tea and converse in low tones. Other debutantes reply to correspondence, writing notes in elegant script and affixing them with sealing wax. Meanwhile, chaperones give orders to the servants and see to Perdurance's household accounts. The light is a flushed yellow, aut autumnally ripe. Yeah, you know, my first reaction when I read this um, debutante reply to correspondence, my first thought is, wait, you're just writing correspondence with a capital C, the language of the suns? And then I realized, oh, no, it's, it's just non-capital correspondence. You know, just normal letters, not sigils that sear the very air. Okay, I'm, I need to look this word up. The Arate Duchess, assuming I'm pronouncing that correctly. Ah, it's pronounced Oriet, like Aura. Oriet, made of or having the color of gold, or when describing language, highly ornamented or elaborate. Oriet, Oriet. So the Oriet Duchess in her pink and purple silks. Charm the servants. What are my chances? 30% chance. Charm the chaperones. Ooh, 100% chance. Charm the debutantes, 66% chance. Search for Wilma. Somewhere in Perdurance, there is a rat. Oh, I suddenly just remembered the Rat Brigade talking about them. I think what they said about Wilma, they were like disgusted because they'd heard that Wilma was living their life as a pet. Which, I mean, you know, they're a, a rat just as intelligent has the whole rat brigade, so to be a pet is demeaning. Let's search for Wilma. Find her in the afternoon. A bored chaperone answers your question. Oh, the little fat one? Uh, no, she'll only come out later. Her owner doesn't wake up till the afternoon. Hidden in your sleeves, Cinder's, qu Cinder's quivers with indignation. Oh, Cinder's. Let's find a way below the stairs with the Incognito Princess. Just a reminder, Elizabeth likes the Incognito Princess. Romantically. Dearest mother showed me the plans, says the princess. The engineers should be back here. Engineering. I do so wish to observe them. Let's rush. She gestures at a seemingly solid wall and urges you to follow. The loom chambers below stairs thunder and smoke. There are rows upon rows of hour looms, each tended by weavers with their hair pinned tightly back. The heat of the cooking combines with the shudder of machinery in pandemonium. Watching over it all are the theoretical engineers, access to them barred. Engineers only, states the sign in an angry font. Get the driver. The driver's an engineer. They could get you in. Oh, sweet. 
unlocked when you're in possession of a driver. It, <laughs> it always cracks me up and just sounds so odd when, you know, to fulfill the requirements for doing a thing. It's like, yes, you possess a person. Gather the rats, the engineers. Mm, pose as an engineer. I mean, I have 100% chance of success for that, so like, what the hell? That sounds like fun. Yes. Let's do that. that <laughs> Elizabeth's gonna have a lot of fun with this. They're like, come on, princess, watch this. It's easy to get in it if you're an engineer, which you're not, but they don't know that. I'm good at lying. Rude mechanicals. All it takes is a few gibberish statements about levers and cogs, and the guards are entirely convinced that you're an engineer. You're rushed into a meeting of your peers. The incognito princess is enchanted by the turning machinery, and the engineers are as enchanted with her. They form a hive of activity around her, competing to answer her questions. She seems unsatisfied and presses harder. Change is the one constant, though, she says. How do you truly prevent it? By what methods does change try to escape your bondage? She realizes you're still there and dismisses you, saying she can find her own way back. She found what she sought at Perdurance. We get a thousand experience. Return to the mask. They're tight. They're tight and steep. I should probably read the full sentence. The stairs back up to the morning room are tight and steep. Um, let's... Who do I want to charm? Not just based on my chances. My best chances are with the chaperones, but like, what group do I want the favor of? The servants rushing here and there, they're a blur of efficiency and sobriety amidst Perdurance's opulence. Chaperones, they cluster around the debutantes watching over them with habitual pinched expressions. Or the debutantes, a gleaming group of young men, women, and others, each more elegantly dressed than the one before. Hmm. This is try to win favor with both the servants and the debutantes. Well, that sounds good. Partial six. Wait. Wasn't that 100% chance? It was. The chaperones are more than servants, but decidedly less than debutantes. You are a first-hand witness to their awkward position. A servant makes a claim of impropriety towards a debutante, who laughs it off. The chaperone hurries over to prevent the incident from escalating into a scene, but there are no witnesses. She casts you an imploring look. The consequences will be far less for you, a visitor only here for a day, than for her, who must remain here always. Who will you support? Oh, this is easy. Elizabeth's just like, fuck these opulent assholes. Support the servant. Uphold the servant's claim. The debutante flushes and is escorted away by the chaperone. They will miss the evening's ball. The servant thanks you, before the chaperone ushers them back to work. Morning ends, it is time to move on. You now have one servant's favor. Move onwards. One of the dowager duchesses rings a bell. Conversation halts with practiced suddenness. Morning is over. Through the darkness. Everyone arrays themselves in a procession according to their station. The dowager duchess at the front, debutantes just behind, then chaperones and visitors, and the servants bringing up the rear. There's much jostling for a position within each group, according to rules that you cannot begin to fathom. You enter the narrow and twisting passage, stumbling in the enveloping darkness as the debutantes giggle and shout. With each step, the shrieks of hours being spun backwards resonates through your body, leaving you shaking and worn. You emerge, blinking into the dazzle of afternoon. Here, the curtains are pulled back with tasseled ropes, allowing the clockwork sun to spill its stark gold into the dining room. The long table is set with rows of gleaming china dinner plates patterned with delicate florals. Silver cutlery, polished to a high shine, gleams atop a pristine tablecloth. Servants pour endless glasses of watered wine or carry in the next in a 
uh, carrying the next in a stream of elaborate dishes. Okay, go find Wilma, Charma Chaperone. Uh, let's convince Wilma to speak to the brigade. A plump white rat sits in a little golden cage. A dandy is idly feeding her slivers of camembert. He's happy for you to confer with his pet. This will always advance the story, but failure may impact Wilma's part in it. Oh, and there's only a 55% chance of success. Hmm. Yeah, so as it says, it's always going to advance the story, so it's still going to go somewhere even if I fail, but God, what's going to happen to Wilma? Maybe, God, it probably decides on whether I can kind of convince them to, to leave and come with us versus them staying here as a pet. Okay, I'm going to do it. So 55% chance of success. It's not great, but it's slightly more than half. I mean, I could try to super game this and, you know, save this for some other time after I've leveled up a bit or try to leave this place and then switch out my officers for ones that might give me more heart and then come back, but let's just go with it. It's a decent chance. I'm sure it'll be interesting no matter which way it goes. Come on, Wilma. Please. Ah, fuck. Brief reunion. Wilma patters from the dandy's palm to yours. Her whiskers twitch as Albrecht emerges from your sleeve. You're here for my part of the number? Albrecht nods solemnly. Wilma presses close to him. And they say something in German. The number is... You don't make out her words. She gives Albrecht a playful nip as she withdraws. Is Cinder's here? Wilma asks you. Something moves in your sleeve, but nothing emerges. Wilma nods, wishes you luck, and returns to her cage. Yeah, so, like, they still helped us, but... I'm guessing they would have come with us? Okay, um, I want to know what they said in German. I'm going to translate that. Aw, oh, what Wilma said was, Your whiskers are unkempt, my dear. That's sweet. Afternoon ends, it's time to move on. Now have one debutante's favor. I guess just from interacting with their pet. Move onwards. Twisting, turning. A passage opens behind the china cabinet and the procession forms once more. You take a breath and step into the close, stifling darkness, trying not to fall behind as the passage contorts and coils. With each step, the shrieks of hours being spun backwards resonates through your body, leaving you shaking and worn. You spot a figure masked in a featureless black, their face covered by a smooth oval of polished obsidian. Who are they? It's an enormous relief to spell out, spill out into evening at the grand ballroom. Everyone finds their place without a murmur, and courtly life is resumed, almost as though the terrors you just experienced never existed. Hanging from the grand ballroom ceiling is a vast ormolu Gasolier, its spidery arms decked with cut crystal drops. It casts soft yellow brightness onto the masked dancers below as they twirl across the polished parquet floor. Music blends with the hum of genteel conversation and the stiff swish of starched crinolines. The half-light mask is in full swing. There's barely room to stand, much less move. Okay, there's two words here that I want to look up the definitions for. Okay, Ormalu is a gold-colored alloy of copper, zinc, and tin used in decoration and making ornaments. Yeah, some sort of a... I think Wikipedia goes into a bit more detail. Uh, it's a gilding technique of applying finely ground high-carat gold mercury amalgam. So it's a way of making things look fancy by putting a coating of gold-colored stuff on them. And parquet is flooring composed of wooden blocks arranged in a geometric pattern. Which maybe doesn't bring anything to mind, but if you look at images on, on Google Images, then it'll make sense. Just kind of geometrically aligned boards. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Since the chaperones are 
charm the servants. Like, I want to charm the servants specifically, but my chance at winning, at succeeding at that is terrible. Whereas if I assist the chaperones, I may try to win favor with both of the servants and the debutantes. Don't quite understand how that works, but uh, let's do that. The chaperones wear drab versions of the debutantes' masks, animals patterned in, patterned in shades of brown and gray. They prowl the ball, ensuring that no one is getting too friendly. You help one break up an assignation? assignation between two of their wayward charges. The chaperone's eyes blazed with such indignance you imagine the paste gems at her ears and throat gleam with reflected fury. As you drag the recalcitrant debutantes from behind the heavy fustian curtains, you notice that the glass of the arched windows behind them is covered in a layer of soot, blocking out any possibility of sunlight. Wait a minute. The glass of the arched windows behind them is covered in a layer of soot, blocking out any possibility of sunlight. Is that on purpose? I mean, calling it a layer of soot makes it sound like it's just really damn dirty. But, pointing out that it blocks any possibility of sunlight makes me wonder if they've... Hmm, they haven't mentioned darkness a lot. As we go through the tunnel or whatever in, to, into a different part of the day, as the hour looms spin. Are they... Are they making all this stuff work, not just by using hours and hour looms, but also keeping out the sun's rays so that they don't get affected by... I, I don't know the sun's laws, the judgment, the whatever. You know, similar to what happened with that uh, entity in that box, completely blacked out. Right, well I have two debutantes favor and two servants favor. Don't know what, I'm, what I can do with that favor. Listen to an anxious chaperone or move onwards. Uh, let's listen. One of the chaperones approaches you as the evening ends. She has one, one blue eye and one green. I need your help, she says. The Eye. You're trusted by both servants and debutantes, and that is rare indeed. It inclines me to hope that you may be admirable. Thus, I ask you for a favor. You're a traveler. I trust something to your care. Without a pause, she pushes her fingers into her own eye socket and pulls the eye out with a wet pop. She holds it out to you expectantly. Are you expected to take this? Wait. On closer inspection, the eye is glass, although... The iris is inlaid with emerald and jet, flecked with gold. My family committed themselves to the Brabazon work world to pay off their debts. This will buy years off their service. I beg you, take it to them. You wrap the chaperone's eye in your cuff. Perhaps if you're traveling that way. The more I hear about this Brabazon work world thing, the more it sounds terrible. I think I've heard three mentions of them. The first one was those plinths at Hybris. The second one, I don't remember. And then this is the third one. Committed themselves to Brabazon work world to pay off their debts. Indentured servitude, it sounds like. Is that why it's called work world? It's the world you go to when you need to work? Ah, oh, fuck, it sounds terrible. And it sounds like we can go to it, which is going to be interesting. I hope Elizabeth can get up to some revolutionary things there. You've agreed to deliver a jeweled eyeball to Brabazon. Move onwards. The music stops. Somewhere below, a mechanical rumble can be heard as the hour looms begin spinning perdurances one perfect perpetual day all over again. Half-Light Mask is over. One of the blacked-out ballroom windows opens to reveal the passage back to the parlor at dusk, or perhaps dawn. The keening of the hours as they are spun backwards makes your legs weak and your heart pound. You feel unaccountably wearied. You spot a figure masked in a featureless black, their face covered by a smooth oval of polished obsidian. Who are they? That's, again, we had that happen last time. You enter the parlor through the portrait of the Empress and limp away, sore-footed from dancing and stumbling through the dark. Behind you, the members of the Court of Perdurance chatter and take tea and make ready to begin their day anew. For tonight, and every night thereafter, is the Half-Light Mask. 
so nobody ever sleeps, because they just rewind the day. Is that right? That sounds like hell. Or, I mean, maybe it would be nice for a bit, but it sounds like it would turn into hell. Spending the day at Perdurance reduces your terror, and depending who you pleased and how much, may grant other rewards. Ah, so it looks like we can be asked to help her or whatever they're going to ask of us, by the servants, or the debutantes, or chaperones. For some reason, we're only getting the chaperones. What, what does this require? End the day closer to the servants than the debutantes. Oh, I was equal between the servants and the debutantes. This requires what? I did make an impression, but... End the day closer to the debutantes than the servants. Okay, can't be even. You were equally, equally popular with both the debutantes and the servants, a feat the chaperones admire. The chaperones were impressed by your equanimity. I... Hmm... That's not actually how I want it to be. I don't want to be equi equanimous, equa, whatever. I don't want to be equal between the debutantes and the servants. I want to be firmly with the servants. Uh, well, let's see what happens. Oh, my terror just went to nothing. Oil on troubled waters. Never let it be said that you allowed class to dictate the breadth of your friendships. God, I hate that, because I, I, the, the chaperones murmur quiet congratulations, remarking how your presence smoothed what is often a difficult day. They do hope you'll return. You leave richer in gossip and soothed by the distractions of the half-light mask. Hmm, that doesn't feel good. That is not Elizabeth. Allowing class to dictate the breadth of your friendship. Elizabeth does very much allow class to dictate the breadth of her friendships. But not in the, like, you know, looking down on uh, poor people or people beneath you, but rather looking down on people above them. That is kind of funny sounding, isn't it? Looking down on people above you. We could just go in again right now. Let's stand for Parliament in Perdurance. The debutantes wouldn't sully their perfect day by voting, of course, but perhaps some of Perdurance's servants and chaperones might be moved by democratic spirit. Ooh, success. The election is called. At least a few of the people bother going to the polls. Is this being... Is this being live-streamed on Twitch? I got a camera here. The votes are in. An angry lady in a silken gown harumps at her defeat. Your charismatic gentleman makes all the right sympathetic noises, until finding out that he, too, has been defeated. You wait for your name to be called out. Sure enough, the people chose well. To a smattering of applause from the handful of the public who bothered to show up and vote, you rise from your chair to take your destiny. <laughs> take your destiny. Oh yeah, this is my destiny, to be an MP. Passing laws that nobody pays any attention to. Accept your new role with grace, or accept your new role without any grace whatsoever. Oh, fuck yeah. Push past the losers. Bask in the glory that is you. This whole thing's a joke. You've done it. Time to prepare for government. Begin your career at the floating parliament. It's saying all these things to make the sound sort of serious. Begin your career, and it's your fate. Bask in the glory. But it's obviously joking. I, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to get to do with the floating parliament, but it's not going to be anything useful. The election is over. Well, I don't think I want to have another day just yet, but our aunt is here. Dear God, I wonder if they, maybe they just follow us around, you know? Like maybe there's a random chance when you come to a port that they'll just be there. Who the hell knows? What? Somehow, oh wait, no. no. Oh, this is the same thing they said last time. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing they said last time. It, it says you can always recruit her later, though you will risk her wrath. But she's not giving me any wrath. That's... weird. Did I somehow, like, not save the event where I told them to fuck off or something? 
So I've been told by some people in the comments that if I don't take the aunt that I'm not going to have a quartermaster for a very long time. I'm okay with that. That's fine. I've also been told there's some really interesting stuff that happens if you have her on board and they couldn't say more without spoiling it. Which, God, that makes me want to take her, but it just... Mm, it just isn't what Elizabeth would do. It just really does not feel right at all. I don't want to take somebody on board because I'm worried about missing content, right? Like, if I take them on board, it's not because it makes sense or anything like that. It's because oh, I want the stats to get me a little uh, six more iron and two more mirrors, and I want to see all the content, which is tempting, but... I'm trying to lean more into role-playing Elizabeth, and it really doesn't feel right. That is not what Elizabeth would do. Even down to the description, it feels wrong. If I accept them, it says filial piety demands as much. No, we... Mm. Elizabeth does not feel any... filial piety, or piety, however you want to pronounce that. No, I'm still not going to take her. Still waiting for that wrath. Wait, can I just, like, talk to them again? Yes, I can keep talking to them and keep gaining terror. <laughs> I can just keep gaining terror. <laughs> okay. Alright, well, I think this is a pretty good place to end the episode. So, I hope you've enjoyed so far, and when I return... Well, hmm. I'm either going to spend another day at Perdurance, or go take my position as an MP at the Floating Parliament, or maybe both.